Hi everyone, Dr. Hall here, and we're going to start talking about the process of birth. This first part, Lecture 17a, we're just going to kind of introduce the topic of birth in humans and then talk about stage one of birth, which is labor. So first of all, birth in humans is different than for other animals and especially different compared with other mammals. So we tend to have much bigger heads, relatively speaking, and also much narrower pelvises. And as you can see from these diagrams, it is a very, very tight fit. So why are our heads so big? Well, it's because we have these big, juicy brains, right? We have much larger brains relative to the rest of our body size than other mammals. Now, why are our pelvises so narrow? Well, it happens to be because of the fact that we walk upright on two legs, that we are what we call bipedal. If you're quadrupedal and you walk around on all fours all the time, you actually can have a much wider pelvis and still have a steady gait. For us, however, if we had a really wide pelvis, then every time we were walking, we would be rocking way far from one side to the other. And that makes the process very inefficient in terms of the muscular effort required. Um, so we've evolved to have narrower pelvises um, because that takes less energy to then walk around on two feet. So because of the fact that we have these big heads and these narrow pelvises, human babies are actually born very immature compared to other mammalian babies. So, you know, we have an example here of a foal or a baby horse being born. And if you've ever seen this, you know, with a, even a cat or a dog or a cow or a horse, Within minutes after being born, they are standing up and then they are walking around within the hour often. And so, but humans, it takes us like a year to walk, right? So we're born relatively immature compared to other mammals. And the reason for that is if we stayed inside any longer, we would just get too big and we wouldn't be able to fit out. So uh, human gestations are relatively brief. We are born relatively immature because of our big heads and our narrow pelvises. And that's also the reason why we are one of the only mammals that routinely gives birth in the presence of others. If you've ever had a cat, you know, they kind of go somewhere and hide to have their kittens. Uh, we need help usually. So humans historically have given birth in the presence of others. This is that same information in text form in case you missed some of it. So birth is divided into three stages. The first is uterine contractions or labor, which we're going to talk about in this section of the lecture. Stage two is pushing or fetal expulsion. And stage three is expulsion of the placenta. So let's talk about stage one, labor. So what this is, is the uterus starts to contract. That middle layer, the myometrium, the muscular layer of the uterus, squeezes down on the baby and pushes the baby's head down against the cervix. That pressure of the baby's head down against the cervix, which you can see here, right, acts like a dilating wedge. So as we can see in this first diagram, that the cervix is very thick. It's usually about three centimeters thick to start. It's like a big tunnel with a tiny, tiny, tiny opening. So it's usually closed. It's usually not dilated at all. So what will happen with this repeated pushing of the baby's head against the cervix is it acts like a dilating wedge. And so the cervix starts to thin out and open up. Right, so you can see there's an opening here now. Eventually, over the course of labor, this will keep happening and happening and happening to the point where the cervix becomes fully thinned out and dilated. We call that 10 centimeters. And you really, if you examine with a gloved hand, you really can't feel any cervix at all here. You can just feel the baby's head and there's nothing in the way. So what regulates this process? 
Well, guess what? It's a positive feedback mechanism. So as the baby's head is forced toward the cervix, the cervix, cervix gets stretched and it sends signals up to the pituitary gland. Sorry, that wasn't in there. And the pituitary gland is going to make a hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin then causes continued and stronger uterine contractions, which then push the baby's head down more forcefully, which then stretches the cervix again, which stimulates the pituitary, which causes more oxytocin, and so on and so on, and it builds and builds and builds. So remember, positive feedback mechanisms are when you want things to build, 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 and then kind of something change, right? It's usually some type of explosive event. So ovulation is a positive feedback mechanism where we had that positive feedback loop between estrogen and LH in the middle of the menstrual cycle that resulted in the oocyte being released from the ovary. We also had positive feedback mechanisms for breastfeeding when we talked about breast physiology. And so you might remember that oxytocin was involved there too, right? That was for the milk ejection reflex. And we also had prolactin, which was for the function or the production of milk. So that was also a positive feedback mechanism. And the other positive feedback mechanism that we've talked about in this course is for orgasm. So the reproductive system has lots of positive feedback mechanisms. There's really no other systems in the human body that use these, generally speaking, because they're not good for home homeostasis. They're good for changing what's happening. So this is all of those things in detail, right? So again, those uterine contractions push the baby's head against the cervix. The cervix getting stretched signals the pituitary gland, which makes uh, which causes us to release oxytocin, which causes stronger contraction. So it builds and builds and builds. At the end of it, right, our goal is to get a fully dilated, fully thinned out cervix so that there's no longer any barrier to pushing the baby out of the body. So that cervix was acting like a door that was closed. So this stage of labor generally takes anywhere from about three to 36 hours. Typically it's shorter in women who've given birth before and longer in women who are having their first childbirth, uh, but those are just general rules of thumb and they can vary tremendously. Um, I've had patients before who had precipitous labors that took less than 40 minutes. <laughs> so, um, you know, it varies from person to person. A lot of times people ask me, what about when the water breaks? It usually happens during labor. Sometimes it happens before labor. And what that is is a rupturing of that amniotic sac that has that fluid surrounding the fetus inside the uterus. So sometimes it ruptures before labor starts. It usually ruptures during during labor and very very rarely it will still be intact at the end of stage one and sometimes the baby will be born inside the amniotic sac it's called a call c-a-u-l very unusual for that however now sometimes somebody's body doesn't go into labor on its own, so they'll get induced. So induction of labor, right, is us doing a medical intervention to try to get this process going or to augment it if it's not kind of strong enough or progressing well enough. The most commonly used method is Pitocin. You might say to yourself, well, that sounds really similar to oxytocin, and it should, because it's basically synthetic oxytocin. We make the same chemical, but in a laboratory, and we give it through an IV. Now, the, the difficulty here is that we're giving it exogenously, right? It's not her own body producing it, so we're just kind of giving it to her. And so we have to kind of carefully titrate the dose. It's hard to know different doses for different people. So we have to monitor this situation really closely. So there will be monitors placed on the woman's belly to feel the force of the uterine contractions. Sometimes if monitors placed on the belly aren't giving us good enough measurements, they'll have to put a little pressure catheter inside the uterus to see what types of contractions are happening. 
the woman has to be hooked up to an IV and there also has to be baby monitors and heartbeat monitors for the baby because sometimes the contractions that occur with Pitocin are stronger and more uh, forceful than natural contractions which can be stressful for the fetus so we have to monitor the fetus really closely um, so being induced um, is not something that you want to have happen if you can avoid it because you have to be hooked up to a lot of monitors and IVs um, it tends to be uh, pretty painful um, so it's 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 not fun but if it needs to be done it needs to be done right so if somebody's gone past their due dates or there are some complications where we need to get labor going uh, you know we kind of make those decisions weighing the risks and benefits other things that you can do to try to get labor going include nipple stimulation which you can see in the bottom right picture oh that's a cat all right so Oliver wanted to come say hi right and so sometimes some birth centers or hospitals will even hook women up to a breast pump because right as you know that nipple stimulation can also uh, stimulate the release of oxytocin so sometimes that can be a way to get labor going or augment it and then finally another way that we will sometimes induce labor in folks is to use a medicine called mesoprostol that's a prostaglandin like medication that they place in the cervix to encourage it to open and you might remember from when we talked about dysmenorrhea or really painful periods that prostaglandins also stimulate uterine contractions right and people who have primary dysmenorrhea they often have high prostaglandin levels so their uterus is just really contracting hard with their periods but so we can use a proglass prostaglandin medicine sometimes to induce labor as well so in summary birth in, in humans is more difficult than in other mammals for the most part we have pretty big heads and small pelvises relatively speaking so stage one of birth is labor this process of regular uterine contractions that's that myometrium that middle layer of the uterus that force the baby's head down against the cervix which not only thins out and dilates the cervix because we need to get that fully dilated and out of the way but it also then sends signals up to the pituitary to make more oxytocin which then causes more uterine contractions and the cycle continues and so that's why people will have contractions you know often they might start off every 10 or 15 minutes apart and then once things get really going they're every seven minutes then every five minutes every three minutes apart and so on until they reach the point when the cervix is fully dilated and when the cervix is fully dilated and out of the way we're going to enter stage two of birth which is pushing or fetal expulsion and we'll talk about that in 17b